Hey, what's up, Mixed Church? So great to be with you here, wherever you find yourself um, this morning. I'm just so glad that you took the time to invest in yourself, to invest in your community, and to be present with us. I believe God is going to use this time to make us more like Him. Hey, this could be the moment that some real things change and shift and unlock for you, because I know that God has got a word for you this morning. We're starting a new series called Eyes on the Road that's been on my heart forever. And I believe with so much anticipation that this is going to change us as a people. I really believe that. So buckle in. Let's go. Eyes on the Road. Here we go. Uh, We're going to talk today about the central theme of our series here called Eyes on the Road. And um, it centers around this father out of Luke 15 who is... Uh, who has some, a relationship with his sons. And so this is Jesus telling a story about a father and his two sons. And the younger son it takes his money and his inheritance earlier, basically saying, Dad, I think you're dead to me. Give me the money. I'm going to go. And he goes and starts living loose with all of it. And, um, and we're going to pick up the story here in Luke 15, verse 17, when, uh, when, the, when the younger son comes to his senses, is what um, the Bible says. Ready? Luke 15. Verse 17, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, back with his father, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I'll go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned and found his father. And while he was still a long way off, say a long way off, I didn't hear you all the way at home. I need you to say it. Say a long way off. Yeah, this is a two-way street here. There's nobody around to be embarrassed about. (laughs) While he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. He embraced him and he kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer, longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick! Bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him, get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For my son was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. Say the party began. Let's go. I like this dad. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. He returned home. He heard music and dancing in the house and he asked one of the servants what was going on. He said, your brother's back. He was told, and your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him, but he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to do. And in all that time, you never once gave me a young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when the son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. His father said to him, Look, Dear son, say, dear son, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day where your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. Would you all pray with me wherever you're at? If you're driving, don't close your eyes, but anywhere else, you know, this is kind of, let's pray. God, we love you so much. We are thankful for your words. We are thankful that you are this kind of father, and we are thankful for the opportunity to learn more about who you are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Aren't parents, like, kind of annoying? Man, I think, I, I think parents are annoying. I used to think parents were super annoying. Like, I don't need to see any more ki- pictures of your kid's Halloween costume. One is enough. But you've got three weeks of Instagram stories from Halloween, and then it's they're going to put a, dress him up like a turkey. And, he's kind of, and your kid is cute. I get it. Your kid is cute. But I don't want to see your kid anymore. You can keep your kid to yourself. You know what I mean? And it's, I feel the same way sort of about these like, about, about really cute couples. It's like just enough with the pictures. You know, I don't need to see these pictures again. I don't need to see. You guys are just, it's, a, it's annoying. Or I used to think it was like very annoying. I don't want to see all, like, But then I got married. But then I had a son. And now I totally get it. If you go back through my Instagram history, man, it's just like mostly pictures of my son. 
all of my highlights in my stories is just like it's just pictures of him being amazing there's a couple go check them out they're amazing i think you should go see him and here i am now being that annoying parent something that was like way more than i expected was how much i was going to love leo way more than i expected and, every, and everybody tells you this, and so if you don't have kids, you're sitting there, you're like, yeah, yeah I get it. You're going to love your kids. But I'm telling you, it's way more than you expect to. It's the kind of thing that's just like, oh, man, even now, when I come home, I've been traveling a lot, I come home, and I, I see him, it's this, like, big moment of, like, oh, and I, my heart just, like, explodes, and it's, like, new levels of love and joy over this presence of this three-year-old who doesn't really do much but, like, I mean, he gives, like, really great hugs and stuff, but for the most part, he's just eating, sleeping, some fits, a lot of love. But, like, there's just so much supernatural love there. And if you don't have kids, I don't know that you can know about it, but by experience, having kids, you kind of, like, experience it. it was way, way, way more than I expected. And there's something about, like, seeing this. Even, like, as I'm saying this now, I'm like, wow, I bet this is, like, it's kind of, like, uncomfortable, like, talking about how much I love this kid so much that it's like, it's, it's beyond words. It's a sort of feeling like, Father, so, oh my gosh, so much love. It's something that kind of makes it uncomfortable. Um, and I think even as we read this story, part of this story, the way the Father responds makes us just, yeah, maybe just like a little uncomfortable. Like, not exactly what we would expect to, and maybe not even what we'd hope to find out of this Father. And right where we picked up the story, we see what the son expects to find. Like with Leo, I ex- like with having kids, I expected to find love. But man, what I actually found was so much bigger. And the same thing is true here of this son. It's like he expected to find a generous father who's been kind to his servants. And maybe he'll even take me in to be a servant here in the house. He expected to find a generous father. But what he found was somebody who redefined generosity for him. Somebody who redefined grace for him. Somebody who redefined love and compassion for him. And I want to say that this is God. This is what he's like. When you hear a preacher or when you hear your friend or you read in the Bible, some of the God, like God is love. When you read that, we start to expect, like, I need love. Oh, God is love. But then when you begin to experience it, let me just tell you that it's on another level. God is so much more than we understand. So when we talk about God, we're like, oh, God is love. We think, oh, God is love like I know. No, God is love like you've never known. We think God is love like we've known, but God is love like you've never known. You've never seen it. You've never experienced it. And even those of us who've been walking with, in faith for a long time, you're like, yeah, that love is good. I'm here to tell you it's better than you know. This was a son who grew up in his father's house. Even the older son didn't really get it. He grew up in his father's house. He knew him every single day. What's up? Good morning. How was your night? How'd you sleep? Oh, so coming in from the fields. How was work today? You know, all that stuff. He knew him every single day, but he still, he knew he was generous, but he didn't know the depths of his generosity. And I want to say this, man, there is so much more to the generosity, to the grace, to the love, to the forgiveness, to the power of God than any of us know. Whether you're just starting this journey or you've been on it for a long time, I want to say you that there is more in God for you. That there's more love, more compassion, more forgiveness, more power, more goodness, more generosity than you could even begin to understand. And I think a lot of times we're like, oh, that makes me a little uncomfortable thinking that there's God is out there loving me this way. And I want to say this, like, This father is unbelievable, not even on the same level as anything we've ever understood, but we can miss out on something awesome because it makes us uncomfortable. We can miss out on the experience of God because it kind of makes us a little bit uncomfortable. It makes us uncomfortable because we don't understand it. That's at the core of this whole thing. It makes us uncomfortable if we don't understand it. The second son in the story here, the, the older son who was found working in the fields, he comes in, he's like, what's this party all about? What are we doing with the, having a party here? 
He can't understand the love because he doesn't understand the love that the father has for him. He doesn't understand the love he has for his other son, for his brother. And so it makes him uncomfortable. And so often we get this way. I love that the scriptures don't tell us anything about the, second, the first son's response. The younger son who ran away and comes back. All it says is like they throw a party and you find him in the room. When we misunderstand him, we miss out on him. When we misunderstand him, we miss out on him. Imagine the joy the second son could have felt had he just understood that this isn't about, for the, for the father, it's not about all of the money spent on prostitution. It's not about, all, it's about loving his son. How much do we miss out because we misunderstand? The son won. The first son, the younger son, misses out because he didn't understand the love of the father, the generosity of the father, and, and, and he left. The second son misses out too. He, did, he, was, he was home the whole time, but he didn't understand it, so he missed out on the experience with the father as well. I don't want us to be the younger son or the older son. I want us to be the kind of people who understand who God is. So we're going to do that today. We're going to dig in and we're going to set the record straight today. God is not a mystery. He has given us the Bible. He has told us what he is like and he, and he wants us to experience him as he is. So we're going to dig in because I don't want to miss him because I misunderstand him. I want to understand what God is and who he is and what he's like and the depth of his love so I can experience all all that he has for me. So today, we're just going to brag on God for a minute. We're just going to talk about how great God is. How about that? Sounds great. <laughs> I can't hear you, but I believe that you're shouting me down right now because this is good. In faith, house parties all over the place, just kind of like, oh, yeah, and you're standing up yelling at the TV. <laughs> Maybe not. But feel free to do that if the Spirit moves you in that way. Let's not get this wrong about God, because when we misunderstand him, we miss him. So I don't want us to get it wrong. Let's not get this wrong. He put a habit to his heart. He put a habit to his heart. God loves you, and that makes him do stuff. That changes the way he acts towards you. Do you ever have a friend that like, says, well, man, I love you. I love you. Oh, I love you so much. I love you, bro. I love you, man. I love you. Oh, I love you. But, and then they're just, that's all they ever do? Their life doesn't change. They never call to check in. They never text to check in. They never make room on their schedule for a coffee. And they never uh, um, do even any of the little things. Even, even when you're together, they feel like sort of distracted and stuff. And then um, when you're gone, they're like, hey, love you, bro. And you're like, ah, I don't know. It doesn't sound like love, and it doesn't look like love to me. But God's not like that. God says I love you, and the overwhelming Proof of his life and his love comes at us like a freight train. Here's an example. He set up his life. This father set up his life in a way that when the son was still a far ways off, he could see him. The son didn't have to get to the front door and ring the doorbell. He made a way to make sure that he sees the sun a far way off. I don't know if he had people patrolling the perimeter saying, hey, I know he's coming back. When he comes back, come get me. Or if maybe, the, maybe like in the morning, around noon and at night, he just walked around to go see if he could find him. I don't know if he's having like business deals. You know, he's talking like, hey, I've got all of this wheat over here or whatever. And, I, and out the corner, he's just kind of always looking out the corner of his eyes like, hey, here he is. But he had some kind of way of knowing while his son was far off, still didn't even make it to his house, that he was going to go find him, that he knew he was coming. See, he puts, he doesn't just love you. He put a habit to his heart. What's in God's heart, he made a habit in his life. And he does this all the same for us. God loves us so much that he has a habit of listening to our prayers. He has a habit of showing up for us when it's hard. He has a habit of responding. He has a habit of being close. He has a, a habit of making all things work together for the good of those who love him. God has a habit for his heart. I 
I just love how confident he is in his own love, in his own generosity that's going to change the son's heart at some point. Can you imagine being one of those servants who's listening? That as he's like, hey, my son is coming home. Would you watch? Would you tell me when he's coming? Or even just like if you're having these conversations, why is he out there walking every day looking for his son? His son has been gone for a long time. He's not coming home. But the father's just so confident in his own love, so confident in his own uh, in his own grace, and his own generosity, that he knows that, hey, that son is coming home, and I'm going to be ready for him. So while this son is planning his own garbage, and he's planning his own uh, mess, and then even as the son begins to turn to plan this whole conversation, his father has already made plans for his reconciliation. So confident in his love that he's got it. He's so confident in his love that he always keeps his eyes on the road. That's it. That's what this whole series is going to be about. That's what this whole season for us as a church is going to be about. It's going to be this. It's keeping our eyes on the road. We're keeping our eyes on the road. Man, this father, he was doing a good job. He didn't let it distract him from what he had to do, but he was always aware of whether or not his son was coming home and when his son was coming home. Who does this? Who loves like this? What kind of a God sits up in he- is sitting up in heaven? What kind of a father is sitting there doing all of his work? He's getting it all done. But in the back of his mind, he's just like, I know he's coming home. I know he's coming home. I can't wait till he comes home. He's just loving him from afar. And even after his son has hurt him immensely, the son was not nice to him. The son wasn't good to him. The son basically said, hey, I think you're dead to me. Give me my inheritance. I'm out of here. And the father was just like, I can't wait till he comes home. Home, and he's been watching and waiting for him to come home. Don't get it wrong. God puts a habit to his heart. There's, there's, there's things that God is doing even today to continually love you. He's not that friend that just stands there and says, I love you, man, and then watches you drown. He's the one who comes down and he helps you. He gets involved and he's watching. His eyes are on the road. His eyes are on your road all the time. He puts a habit to his heart. And then he puts feet to his feelings. Don't get it twisted. We gotta get, we gotta, we can't misunderstand God because I will miss God. So I don't want to do that. We want to know. Here, he put feet to his feelings. I I wish I I've been obsessed with this this moment lately. So as in my prayer time and my I've been just imagining and asking God, like, what is this moment like? When this father saw his son off in the distance. Maybe he's having a conversation with one of the servants about something that needs to happen. And I just think I can just picture him go like, just like, everything stops. Everything gets quiet. Tunnel vision. And he just takes off running. This is not how this should have gone. I just love this moment where he's just like, he's gone. That's not how it should have gone. Not at all how it should have gone. He should have dignifiedly walked to the house, wait till his son got up, and his son gave him this whole speech about repentance, and his father said, let me think about it, right? That's how we would like, oh, that would make sense. But him to just be like, oh, he's back, after the last thing he said to him was, you're dead to me. This father took off running so undignified. See, at at the time... Walking would have been the sign of strength because I'm never in a hurry because no one has the right to tell me that I need to run up to them. Nobody has the right. Like, I just, I just walk nice and easy, nice and slow because I'm, in, I'm, the, I'm the dignified one. I'm the strong one. If somebody has to run, it's because they're not in control. So I'm, I'm in control. It would have been seen as like kind of like a sign of shame for this guy to be like, oh, why is this old man running? But God doesn't care. This father doesn't care about his dignity, about what other people say about his shame. What he cares about, what he focuses on is the way he feels about this son. And he puts feet to his feelings. 
You know, we think we're so far off or that there's this major distance between us and God. And I just want to say that, man, God is continually chasing you down, continually cutting that distance. The Bible says, we just read it, like while he was still a ways off, the father saw him and started running. God celebrates every single step. When you turn and you make a step towards him, it's like he's not far from you. He's close to you. He can't wait to see you. He's so happy about it. And he's back in your life instantly. One of the things I hear so often is this, is like you know, people say, God is far from me right now. I feel, like, I feel like God is far away from me right now. And I just want to say that like, that's a lie. God is not far from you. For anybody tuning in right now, I want to talk to this right to the core of your being and tell you this, that God is not far from you. I'm not even going to say the other side that say you are far from God because that's not true either. Even if you are far from God this morning, he's going to come running from even a far way off. As we turn around, he will celebrate every step. Come running. Before he hears your whole story, and he, he just comes running. God doesn't play hide and seek. I don't know where we got this idea, but it's all over. I hear it all the time. Like God is just hiding himself from me, so I'll come go find him. It's like, get, that's not, that's like middle school like dating. That is not how God of the universe interacts with his people. It, right here, this is how God of the universe interacts with his people. When he sees you far, he runs after you. He doesn't play hide and seek. He puts feet to his feelings. He wants to be close. And his actions prove it. He puts a habit to his heart. He puts feet to his feelings. And he responds with reconciliation. He responds with reconciliation. I want you to watch this. He can't even get his confession out here in the story. It says, he says, his father, um, uh, he says, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you and am no longer worthy of being called your son. His father doesn't even respond to it. He just talks to the servant, says, hey, go get the robe, go kill the calf, give me a ring, give me some sandals. My son was dead and now he's back doesn't even get a chance to get through the confession and have the whole moment that he was waiting for. Man, he is so good. You start to feel that uncomfortable thing start to, to wind up in you. He's just like, he's so good. He's like too good. You're like, no, but like at some point, they're going to have to have this conversation about all the stuff that he did and all that kind of stuff. Like, we don't have a record of it. Jesus didn't tell that part of the story because that's not the part, that's not the story. The story is this, the father loved him so much that before he even had a chance to come home, he went out and got him. He ignores his repentance and just his whole little spiel, he ignores it and he just takes him into the party. That is the goodness and the kindness and the love of this father. He does it again, too, at the end of the story. I don't know if you caught it. If the older brother was angry, he wouldn't go in. In verse 28, and his father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I did all these things. And his father says this, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day because your brother was dead. He's come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. See, the father's at this party for the younger son and realizes that the other son's not there. His older son isn't there. So he leaves the party and runs out to go get the older son. You see, this isn't about the son, what this son did or what that son did. This is all about the father. He just wants everybody at the party. He wants all of his sons in his life, in his house, at the party. See, this isn't about the son. We can't focus on this story and think about how awful the son was and now all of a sudden this son is great and that son is great. We actually have no idea whether either one of these sons changed their stuff. 
but we know exactly what the Father is like. He just wants everyone to be here at the party in his presence. That's you. He wants you at the party in his presence with all of your failures, whether you're self-righteous like this second son or whether you've just been living loose like this other son. He's like, whatever. I just want you here in my presence. Leave that behind. Come on, get into the party. See, so often we think of God as this like cosmic referee who's just waiting for us to make a mistake, but he's not. He's a loving father waiting to give you grace. If he wanted to point out this younger son's sin, he could have done it again and again and again and again and again. He he could have done it forever. He could have made the son feel awful and he would have been justified and what he was saying would be true, but it's not in his character to say those things. What's in his character? To give grace, to give forgiveness, to give love, to accept back the wayward brother, to accept back the self-righteous brother. That's what he's like. You're starting to see and feel why this is just like a little uncomfortable because it's like, man, no, that, that, that younger son's got to pay for what he did. And the father, who's the only one who gets to decide whether or not he should pay for it or he should be forgiven, says, you know what, I'm going to forgive him. And so whether or not you like what this father did doesn't matter. He wants to be, he wants the son to be forgiven. And that can make us uncomfortable because what we misunderstand will make us miss parts of God. And we see this in the life of the older brother now. He didn't get to experience this generosity from the father because he never, uh, uh, because he wasn't willing to uh, go into that place with his father for his younger brother. He didn't understand the father's heart towards his younger brother, so he didn't understand his heart towards him. That the father and the old, the, the younger son, that the older son couldn't understand who the father was to him because he couldn't understand who the father was to his younger brother. See, both brothers missed it, didn't understand who the father was. He's not a cosmic ref waiting for you to make a mistake. He's a loving God who's waiting to give you grace. Every time we see the father in this story, that's what he's doing. Generous when the son wants to run. Generous the whole time with the older brother. Generous when the son comes back and generous with the second son. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Every moment in the story we see the same, same picture of this father. And I want to say it's true in your life as well. The big, big thought I want you to walk away with is this. The things that we think separate us from him are the things that he has separated from us. The things that we think separate us from God. Oh, he could never love me because. Oh, I can't repent enough because. I got to pay him back for this. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe he's generous enough to let me into the kingdom, but for sure not as a son. All of those things that we think define us to him, he has removed from us at the cross. And now he's saying, just come on in. The party's for you. I'm excited that you're here. I'm excited that you're back. The things that we think separate us are the things that he separated from us. He doesn't get into the talk of the history here. There's no talk about where all the money went or he's got to pay it back. He's like, he's got enough money. He's got enough money. Love. He's, not, he's like not worried about all the stuff that the, the younger son took from him. He just wants him in the room. Does that make you uncomfortable? Now we're getting to the root at why God sometimes feels far away from us because his love is fierce. His love is like aggressive. His love is all encompassing. He loves us so, so much that sometimes it makes us uncomfortable. If God feels far, you just got to like, Realize that there's nothing you can do that will make him close and just look to the horizon and see him running. Here's what matters to God. 
that everybody gets to the party, that everyone is in the house, that you're at the party, that you're in the house. I hope today that all of us are seeing a God that surprises us, that we expected that a pastor would talk about the love of God, but that it's so much bigger than we experienced, than we ever expected. That the grace of God, the generosity of this Father should be core shaking to all of us. That if God is like this, that changes everything for me. And let me tell you, God is like this. He's so much better than you could ever expect. His generosity and His grace, His love, His forgiveness, His kindness is so much more than you could ever expect. But here it is. And it's your